I hope you can see that it is not because we think a simple problem is simple, but because we recognize that a very difficult problem is almost beyond our understanding. Now, this drawing is uh, Don Quixote de la Mancha who tries to fight the windmills on the Castilian plains in the 16th century. Don Quixote was quite silly. Uh, he thought he could fight the windmills alone. As you all know, he was wrong. Um, and the reason why I'm putting it up today is that presently you've all seen windmills coming up in different parts of Europe. Well, in different parts of the world, but mostly in Europe, in Denmark, Germany, England, and Spain. Economists are a little bit puzzled by this. In a way, economists are critical of it even because it is very obvious that climate change as a problem is not one that can be fought in Europe alone. Indeed, economists are so uncomfortable about this that to some extent they're warning against something that I can call unilateral, unconditional climate policy. How is that? Well, this is from Greek myths, King Sisyphus, who was sentenced to the burdensome task of getting this rock up on the top of a hill. He failed miserably, and to economists, fixing climate change is a little bit like fighting gravity. It's a very cruel sentencing, but in a way what economists are feeling about climate change, those of them, and that's indeed most serious economists, who think that climate change exists, it's man-made, it's harmful, it's harmful enough that we should do something serious about it, are concerned that if you do something about it and you succeed, it will just lead to others doing less about it. Uh, indeed, if you think that way and you put numbers at it, it is very clear that even if Europe was successful, Europe is a big economic power uh, with about 20% of world emissions. Even if Europe were very successful and eliminated its emissions in the course of this century, you know, by half or by the end of this century, it would barely matter at all for climate change. And the reason is that other regions are growing much faster. Other regions would then be growing faster. Other regions' emissions would then be growing faster. And if you add the free rider problem to that, namely that if Europe were to have an impact on the global climate problem and others responded to that by being less interested in fixing it themselves, it's pretty clear that unilateral emission reductions unconditionally even could be seen as irresponsible. Now that sounds strange, right? But it is possible. Now, you might, may know this guy. Uh, this is Mowgli, a little child that in Kipling's story is brought up in the jungle. Uh, <coughs> the panther and the wolves and his other friends that who have gotten to be fond of this child are very concerned that he might not make it in the jungle. And one of their most important concerns are that other animals that meet him in the forest will be afraid of him. And they'll be so afraid of him because he's so foreign that they might attack him and, or not cooperate for that very reason. So one of the things they teach the man cub is that he must be humble and he is to present himself to the animals in the forest by saying, we are of one blood, you and I. So he is trying to bridge a gap of confidence. And I'm going to use that uh, in my treatment of 
leadership. I think leadership very much is a question of bridging a gap of confidence. And <coughs> I think a major challenge in bridging such a gap of in confidence is that if you are to follow someone, you're concerned about why this person leads you where he leads you. But I'm interested in this question of how is it that cooperation comes about? And I'm asking that as a leadership question. And my leadership question is not so much what a leader does or who he or she is, but what it is that makes others follow. So this is very different from the ways that we've thought about leadership in the few instances that we've done it in economic theory. One of them is a person is the designated leader and we're asking what the consequences of her leadership is. That's called Stuckelberg leadership. And it really doesn't work here because here I'm interested in A, who steps up to become a leader and B, what is it in what she or he does which makes others follow. So one way that I ask this question is, let's think of a band of people, Neanderthals or Norwegians, who are gathered north of a mountain range and fall is coming and the first fall storm has already been there and they all kind of know that we have to cross the mountain range and go south before winter comes. But they're all very concerned that they won't, will not make it. And then one person rises to say, you're going to follow me across the mountain range and we're going to start early tomorrow morning. So we're asking, what is it that makes the rest of us follow? And my idea is, this person may be smarter than me, may be stronger than me, may be taller than me, probably more charming than me, but not much. And the reason for the not much part is I kind of, I don't want to be left behind. I don't want this person to want to run away from me or something like that. Indeed, if I have a wife and two children that I need to bring over, it would be very good for me to know that he has a wife and two children too. I kind of want to know that he is very much like me. And I think that is what's going on when Kipling teaches us about mankind in this beautiful story called The Jungle Book. So I'm going to take a few absolutely exceptional leaders in history and try to see whether I find this theme of proximity, similarity, loyalty, empathy in leadership. I have to look very carefully. I'll tell you that I haven't been consciously very selective, but I've been looking for this. You know, what is it that makes others follow? And then I've basically put up on a list, you know, not knowing much about history, not knowing much about mankind, asking some authors such as Kipling, but mostly about history, can I find this theme? So that's the selective part. Now this is Sun Tzu, Chinese general. He may be a mythical person, but we think that he lived. Fantastic military leader. One of the few things we know about him, one of the things that characterizes people's knowledge about him, is when people say, the only battles I really fought were the ones, no, the only battles I really won were the ones I didn't fight. The only battles I really won were the ones I didn't fight. It's pretty beautiful. He basically tries to avoid conflict. He doesn't go to battle unless he knows he will win. And when he goes to battle, quite typically he doesn't need to fight. These are pretty beautiful things, but the part of it which I have discovered and which I think is particularly beautiful is that what does it mean about him? Well, it means that he values his losses, his battle losses very highly. It means he values his men very highly. When you lead more carefully, you'll see 
He even values his enemy very highly. He would like his enemy not to sustain any losses too. Now that latter part means that his enemy's men are likely to give up if they can without fight and they'll join his forces. Now that is pretty mean. So he has managed to send a signal that he cares about his men. Empathy, loyalty, you can see why his men would like to fight for him, not letting him down when he needs them. Second leader of some significance is Genghis Khan. You've probably heard that he was cruel, but you probably know that he was successful. One thing that you may not know is that Genghis Khan was the first military leader to equip every man to be self-sustained. Now, these are nomads on the northeastern Eurasian steppe. So they know how to move. But what this man does, he says, you'll have a horse, you'll have a blanket, you'll have a food ration, you'll be able to make up fire and survive on your own. Now, to us, that sounds cool, but it sounds pretty obvious, too. Why would you not want that? Well, the fact is, there is not a military leader who wants that because his men may leave him. So part of what military leaders do is to make sure that you are not with food and you are not with blankets and you will ensure that we're okay when we get back to camp at night. So military leaders hate this idea. So then think about how can he do it? He has just said, not only a big group of you may leave me, you may actually leave me alone. Now that is much easier. How can he do that? Well, in effect, he is saying, you know me, I am a great military leader, I care about you, you can leave whenever you want, but you know you're better off here. It's because I care about you, it's because I know this terrain, and you can do no better by escaping, but by the way, you may run away. I have equipped you to do so. In this leader, Jean d'Arc, or in English, Joanne of Arc, of Arc, it is very easy to see. She has, in a way, more easily accessible than many of the others, exactly this property that we, the poor, will follow her because she is one of us. She came out of the gutters, she knows where she comes from, and we follow her, as it happens. In medieval Europe, this was a quality with some handicaps because at that time, church was helping in oppressing the poor and she was burnt at the stake at an age of 19. But people followed her in an amazing fashion. Winston Churchill, probably a great man in many respects and a weak man in others. I think he's most famous for the fact that he enabled the British people to continue fighting when it looked hopeless. And to fight Hitler, which I think is a global public good, if there ever was one. Um, and he does it when he says, in his accession speech as a prime minister in 1940, I have nothing else to offer you than blood, sweat, and tears. So it sounds like he knows what it means to be a normal Englishman and that he is ready to fight on their behalf and on their premises. Gandhi had a confidence problem more than any. Poor India is just tremendously poor, fragmented in all ways, but it is basically a poor agricultural country. And Gandhi is from upper class, well-educated. He's been much of his life abroad. How can he lead the Indian people? That's question number one. And how can he lead the Indian people towards independence, inciting them to fight for independence, but in a nonviolent way? That is not an easy task, is it? What he does is he dresses in 
poor man's robes, like as you can see here, robes. But, and, and he lives in very ascetic ways. He does many things to signal that he empathizes with and understands the rural poor in India. When he approaches the British king in 1947, he carries a goat in a leash. A goat is nothing. We all know that a goat is nothing. But if you are dirt poor, the goat is the difference between having nothing and having something that really matters. So this is all symbolism, but he really uses the opportunities that he has to show the Indian people, the poor in the rural areas, I know your pain. Jack Kennedy, in 1963, needed to communicate in three directions. He wanted to say to the Russians that I am not going to back down. We will maintain an air bridge to Berlin if necessary. Now, if he were to send that signal to the Russians, he would have to speak to the American people because the Russians would know that he's only the president of the United States. He can do nothing without the American people. So he puts the American people in Berlin by saying, I, the US president, am a Berliner. Doing that, American people cannot back down. Doing that, Germans cannot trust him. Doing that, the Russians cannot trust him. A tremendous success in communication, I think. Here is a man who had leadership and cooperation challenges aplenty. I think as a symbol of oppression, many of us would think about apartheid in South Africa. It's like, it is so clear, it is so provoking. And now, the balance is tipping, the blacks will be in power, and the country is going to walk on the knife's edge balance, because if you do too much too quickly to empower the poor and the blacks, you will scare talent and capital away. If you do too much to hold that wave back, you will wreak havoc with because, because you will not be able to control the masses. So this country needs to send a message to the world of peace and reconciliation. And here comes the question, who can ask the oppressed blacks to forgive and be patient. Who can do that? And the answer is someone who has been in prison for the last 27 years. So if he can forgive, he has suffered more than me. I can too. So what I've tried to do here is to demonstrate to you that if our study object is what can generate the following? What can allow us all to follow and cooperate and to define that as leadership? Then I am looking for a theme of proximity, similarity, loyalty, and empathy. There is mu not much of this in economic theory. There's not much of it, and that's not because we economists haven't been studying cooperation, because we really have. It's just that we cannot claim to have understood it all. To us, cooperation is often a mystery. We kind of want to think about it as norms evolving, because what you're seeing in the world, a world with amazing prosperity and peace, is that we humans, in contrast to other parts of the ecosystems, to a great extent have learned to live together in peace and to cooperate and not use much of our energy and creative forces in how to rob each other and destroy each other, but rather to build something together. 
So when we are returning to the question of what on earth is Europe doing, how can we understand that Europe is trying to reduce emissions alone? I think Europe will try to reduce emissions alone for a decade or two or three. And I don't think it's irresponsible. I think it's leadership. And I think we economists have failed to ask, maybe climate change is about leadership. If climate change is about leadership, then unilateral, unconditional emission reductions may not be irresponsible. It may be just the thing to do. Now, we're going to be aware of a couple of things. We're going to be aware of the possibility that there is carbon leakage and that in an intermediate period when things are happening in Europe, not much is happening elsewhere, and there may indeed be some increases in emissions in other countries. But that's going to influence how we're doing it. So it's going to mean that in Europe we're doing mostly in sectors without carbon leakage first. So that's going to be power sector, buildings, and we're going to do a lot on technological change because if you reduce emissions to technological change, you are A, not subjecting your emission reduction to carbon leakage, and B, you're showing the rest of the world that this is not as hard as you thought. Now, being a leader in climate change, we could think about it as a hypothetical question. If Europe has done something by 2030 or 2040 to reduce emissions on its own, and this something was to inspire other countries, you know, this could be India or the US, some countries such as those, to start reducing their emissions, what would, what would the questions be that India were to ask Europe before India said, yeah, I think I'll do some of that? My notion is that India would ask, have you done it? Now, in that answer to that question, we would have to say yes, and we would have to say yes, I have reduced emissions at home. Look at this city, it's emission free, and it, as it happens, we are fine. Or this industry, or look at our energy efficient solutions, something like that. Then India would ask, did it cost you a lot? I think if we answer that question, we would have to say, yes, it's cost us some. But as you can see, it's nothing prohibitive. It can be done. It's cheaper now, by the way, than we, when do we've done it first. And we've gotten something in return. Look, we've got beautiful bike paths in Oslo, just as they've always had in Amsterdam and Copenhagen. And then India would ask, can I do it? And the answer to that question would be, yeah, some of it, you know, some of this is just as well suited for you as it is for me. But some of the things we've done, you cannot do. And some of the things that you need to do, we haven't done. But, you know, we've run some development projects together, some cooperation, and we are getting there. I think that this is much about cooperation. It's much about confidence building. We will have to see each other as pretty similar when we're getting there. A part of that is we have to hope and we have to make sure that the prosperity that we're presently enjoying in the rich world is also catching on in other parts of the world. So this is what I mean by climate policy as leadership, and I thank you for the opportunity.